Hello and welcome back everyone. As we continue our exploration of Ibn Khaldun's Makhidama, and now we turn to a more focused study of his concept of asabiya, or group feeling and group solidarity. So one of the major concepts that Ibn Khaldun discusses in his great work, besides the role of environment and geography upon people, which we will look, look at in the next lecture, is the notion of group feeling and its role in history, the formation of society, and how this too is shaped by the environment. Uh, since all life starts at the margins, or the desert, e.g. the harsh world before progressing forward, humans need intimate bonds in order to survive and eventually thrive. Humans instinctively and naturally turn to their immediate family for the first structure of support and justice in their lives. This is because, as Ibn Khaldun says, love of family and one's own is natural in humans except in the most debased and sinful of men. Quote, Respect for blood ties is something natural among men, with the rarest exceptions. It leads to affection for one's relations and blood relatives, the feeling that no harm ought to befall them, nor any destruction upon them, end quote. Biologically and geographically, this love is inculcated through this double enforcement, blood ties and the reality of living in a harsh environment. It is natural to care for one's blood family because they are, in some sense, you. You come from the same parents. Geographically, this love and intimacy felt by family members is reinforced by the harsh stages of life where one is dependent or looks upon family for their refuge. Over time, the immediate family expands outward to secondary family, the secondary family members. Fathers turn to their brothers, brothers turn to their brothers and their families. This is how the tribe emerges in history. Together, through this intimate bond that Ibn Khaldun calls Asabiya, do people begin uh, to preserve themselves and overcome their environs. Now, don't confuse Ibn Khaldun for sounding a lot like Thomas Hobbes, John Locke, Spinoza, etc., for Hobbes, Locke, and Spinoza all deny this intimate bond of family, blood, and tribe in their states of nature. Humans are not social or seeking justice, as Ibn Khaldun says. They are already um, atomized and asocial and entirely self-interested consumers in the classical liberals, which again stands in contrast to the social and justice-seeking human beings in Ibn Khaldun's uh, sense. It's just, you could see the similarity in the so-called harsh state of nature leading to the formation of human society, yet that movement into human society are for entirely different reasons. The emergence of this group feeling in the form of tribal solidarity is what gives a group or tribe its power. This intimacy felt for others is what leads to other members of the group being willing to die and sacrifice themselves for their tribesmen. They understand, at this point, that it is not about them, themselves. It is about the group. If I must die for the group to survive and thrive, that is, the family, the group to survive and thrive, then this is the ultimate and most noble sacrifice I can make. And I, of course, will be rewarded and honored by my tribesmen. This is why Ibn Khaldun says that although the Bedouin lack intricacy and refinement, although they lack sophistication, though they are not cosmopolitan and are generally unlearned in the sense of being well-versed and well-read, they are, quote, closer to being good than sedentary people, end quote. This is because the harshness of rural life forces people to be moral. It forces people to have close ties with each other in order to survive. In this sense, moral is not about being kind or compassionate or tolerant to foreigners. It is about helping those who are most immediate to you. It is, to quote Jesus, to love your neighbor. 
This is played out in many ways. Eventually, uh, even in culture, uh, where rural people are derided as uh, backwards, they continue to have engaged participatory lives. By contrast, those who end up in the cities, those who have dissipated group feeling, they start to become self-centered. City people do not help others in need in the same way that rural people do. In fact, Ibn Khaldun, being the learned and educated man that he was, implies that learned people who regard the Bedouin as backward are themselves unlearned for their feelings and emotions about what ought to be as opposed to what is, is what guides them. The true educated man understands what is, and what Ibn Khaldun is telling us about what is, is that group feeling, solidarity, and tribal loyalty, and self-sacrifice is very real and in fact very natural. It is the very building block of human society, and when this feeling of togetherness, intimacy, solidarity, loyalty, and self-sacrifice is lost, a society is lost. The society collapses with the collapse of Asabiya. Though, again, Ibn Khaldun is not without seeing the benefits of sedentary civilization, its intricacy, refinement, centers of learning and education, libraries, its grand mosques or cathedrals, its paved roads, houses, etc. This leads to the paradox and tragedy that runs throughout Ibn Khaldun's text. The culture of the city is superior to the culture of the rural Bedouin, but the humanness of the Bedouin is superior to the lack of humanness exhibited by the urban city dweller. It is as if there is a trade-off. In order to be cultured and refined, one gives up their humanity. In order to keep one's humanity, one remains aloof or away or bereft of culture and refinement. Thus, we can also understand what Ibn Khaldun is saying about life in general. Meaningfulness and power in life is related to intimacy. This is not unique to Ibn Khaldun. The importance of intimacy in one's life and in political life is already attested to by Aristotle in the politics, Cicero in his uh, De Republica and De Offices, the Republic around the Commonwealth and on duties and on obligations, and by Christian philosophy more generally. The inverse, however, is also true. The spiral into exhaustive nihilism and meaninglessness, the growth of self-centeredness and selfishness, all reflect uh, the leisure-seeking, self-pleasuring hedonism of the urban dweller. Why is this so? Intimacy leads to the development of those unwritten rules of ethics and filial piety, duty, honor, loyalty. These ideas, beliefs, or feelings are inscribed into men by asabiya. One feels like they must honor their mother and father who help them in their time of need. While we know our parents in their prime, uh, their will come a time as they age in which they will become weak and we are strong and in our prime and when this occurs the reversal of roles takes place just as they helped us in our weakness we feel obliged to help them in their weakness this is because of our humanity our humanness thus i am forced to put my interests aside to take care of my parents i love my brother and sister I seek to protect them from harm. I know which is out in the world, the harm that I also had to battle against when I was growing up. When they are harmed, I seek essentially revenge on those who have harmed my kin. In doing this, I must also put my interests aside to tend to the matter that must be addressed. The bond of intimacy is what gives a group its self-sacrificial ethos. Intimacy is what binds people together in love, in family, in protection, in fulfilling duties and obligations to others, just as they had done to you. Intimacy invokes union. It invokes togetherness. 
By that token alone, intimacy is the great barrier to atomization, alienation, and the road to leisure-seeking self-centeredness. Thus, Ibn Khaldun is also implying throughout the work that the loss of intimacy is the sign of the end of the nation, the end of civilization. Since the nation is the extension of group feeling writ large, a nation in its early stages of life exhibits and embodies asabiya to the fullest. Towards its death stage, group feeling, and therefore intimacy between persons, is lost and is altogether destroyed. This drift from intimacy also leads to revulsion of the actions and ethics of ancestors. As Ibn Khaldun says, the last generation of the nation looks back upon their ancestors and deplores them. They hate them. They don't want anything to do with them. They shun them. This is because not only have they lost group feeling, that intimate bond that connects us with people, but also connects us to the past, it also leads us to make foolish conclusions, like not believing that our ancestors faced difficult and a harsh world, where their actions were often necessary for survival, while we, enjoying the fruits of the pacified and tame environ, accustomed to lives of luxury and softness, believe this is how the world has always been. And thus, we cannot comprehend how in that harsh and destructive and dangerous world our ancestors could have done such deplorable things. When people are no longer willing to take care of their parents, when people come to despise their ancestors for their actions, when one can identify that separation that movement away from Asabiya. This is the movement to the decline stage and the coming emergence of an entirely selfish and atomized civilization, according to Ibn Khaldun. Thus, what Ibn Khaldun is telling us is that civilization, society, social is in the word of society, which comes from the Latin word uh, socius, which means friends, and the struggle for life is a group effort. Without the group, there can be no civilization. It depends upon intimacy, bonds of social and filial solidarity and commitment. Together we are strong, divided we are dead. When groups collide, and they inevitably collide, civilizations do war with each other. The group or civilization with the strongest asabiya or esprit de corps, as Westerners might be more familiar with, emerges victorious. Furthermore, the destruction of the bonds of intimacy is what allows our self-centered material pursuits to explode within city life. Again, it's one of the many ironies Ibn Khaldun sees in the tragedy and the irony of civilization. This is why the city is inferior to the Bedouin tribe encampment in terms of humanism. The rural way is the human way. It is uh, humanity in its most basic, natural, and indeed biological form. The city, by contrast, is the consummation of the dream that men have dreamt, a life of leisure, luxury, and endless self-want and consumption. But Ibn Khaldun says it comes at the cost of group feeling, intimacy, and our natural humanness reflecting those intimate bonds exemplified by the Bedouin. This is why, again, tragic irony appears. The consummation of the city is, in some way, the consummation of what the Bedouin do, in fact, desire. They desire a world free of harshness. For the city is the place where the harshness of the world is no longer a threat. The city is a place where Justice, at least in name, rules supreme. The city is the place where we no longer need to labor 16, 17, or 18 hours a day just to survive. But again, lack of human foresight means that the consummation of the city, of sedentary civilization and way of life, will destroy our own humanity. The success of the city, which brings about the demise of nations and humans, 
is what life itself struggles for. For all life must die. And when life begins to die, it deteriorates from the outside exterior to the center core, now the city. Life forms allow their less important exterior elements uh, to go first in false hope of sustaining the core. Thus, when a civilization is dying, it allows the outer regions to be lost with the trade-off of fortifying the more central regions. This is why, as again, the nation heading into its final stages of life abandons the exterior and the rural regions and only concentrates on the people who live in the cities. Those areas are deemed not important for life in the city, which is now like the central core or the heart of the nation. This represents uh, the loss of those intimate bonds to those people whom the city folk, as Ibn Khaldun says, begin to regard as backward and uneducated. It is important to remember that Ibn Khaldun sees these uh, life cycle patterns as unavoidable. He is the true intellectual uh, insofar that he describes what is rather than how it should be. Again, this gets into questions of normative and positive philosophy. This is why Ibn Khaldun is considered a pivot to modern philosophy, or at least an aspect of modern philosophy. It is not, so to speak, that classical or ancient philosophy wasn't concerned with the what is. It most certainly was. But classical philosophy was also concerned with ideas like uh, the summum bonum, the good life, the ideal life, perfect forms and perfect regimes, and whether or not we can attain such things. In Ibn Khaldun, within the Islamic tradition, and then comes Hobbes, Locke, and Spinoza, and the so-called Enlightenment philosophers, we see such concern as the good life, ideal life, uh, the highest good, perfect perfect forms, and so on, disappear in their philosophical works. It is no longer a concern of the modern philosophers. They simply want to describe what is. Rather, the modern philosophers have turned to the mechanical and mechanistic universe and simply seek to describe those mechanical systems and laws. Yet, even in this turn, the modern philosophers notoriously disagree just as is evidenced with the acceptance from classical philosophers in Ibn Khaldun. And in Ibn Khaldun, that man is a political social animal with deep, intimate bonds. Man struggles to fulfill duties and obligations, but is endlessly tempted with selfishness, which, when acted upon, destroy those intimate bonds, group feeling, and duties and obligations to others. This erodes society. The erosion of society is the downward movement to death that all natural life forms experience, that they go through. But this, Ibn Khaldun says, is the true way of the world. Thus we see he is not a modern mechanical philosopher, but a biological philosopher. He sees everything, he sees the world in the sort of organic, biological rise, fall of life. For Ibn Khaldun, the most important thing a person can do is to recognize what stage of life within the nation he or she is living in. The easiest way to do this is to look at the closeness of human bonds, intimacy, and solidaristic relations between people, between family, and between countrymen. When family atomizes itself, the nation will follow soon afterwards. When family lacks intimate bonds, the nation will soon after, uh, afterward also lack intimate bonds. When the lack of intimate bonds grow, one knows they are living in the terminal decline stage of the nation. This is not to say that all individuals and all families will, will lack intimate bonds, no. Most of the families and the people who live in the peripheral borderlands, who remain living in the desert or the rural zones, will retain those intimate bonds. But since the transfer of power moves from the rural to the urban through the rise of civilization and the construction of cities, it is of little use that these regions still retain such bonds since the centers and organs of power are no longer in those regions. As such, Ibn Khaldun also says in his work, these regions are the first to slip away 
from the dying nation as they are swallowed up by new emerging nations or civilizations which are resolutely filled with asabiya, solidarity and determination, while the decadent civilization is not and seeks compromise with the savages. Therefore, in moments of crisis, which often happen during the decline and death stage of a civilization, the lack of these intimate bonds leads to the people of the declining nation to abandon their duties and obligations. It is every man for himself. They desert. They are unwilling to fight. They allow their work, their city, and their history to be overtaken by the new power on the rise. That new power on the rise is one filled with strong intimate bonds, courageous group feeling, willingness to sacrifice and die so that their group may live on. And so the cycles of history, the rise and fall of civilizations begin anew. Just as one civilization is declining, a new civilization is rising to replace it. There has been a long discussion about Ibn Khaldun and whether his deterministic and indeed fatalistic or pessimistic view can be overcome. Is it possible to retain group feeling? And if so, how can it be done? The reason for, uh, for, for this is, is simple. It is the end of uh, a group feeling whereby Ibn Khaldun sees the, the road to weakness and death. And if this is true, uh, the, the inverse is obviously true when you see the rise of civilizations. It will, they have strong group feeling. So if it's possible to overcome, uh, overcome the decline of a nation, the answer must be uh, from Ibn Khaldun, although Ibn Khaldun doesn't fully suggest this, is we should have a return of group feeling. Retention of group feeling, he says, Ibn Khaldun, is what gives extra life to dynasties that experience such revivals of group feeling and revivals in religiosity, which is also a form of group feeling that binds people uh, together. However, Ibn Khaldun doesn't see a way to prevent the inevitable decline. Even if we experience these revivals, they only temporarily, uh, they only temporarily halt the movement uh, to death. And so this is a concise summary overview of the heart of what Asabiya is in Ibn Khaldun's Makidama. I think it is deeply relevant for those of us, especially living in the West today, to maul over and to wrestle with Ibn Khaldun's notion of group feeling and how we can identify our place in the cycle of civilization based on whether or not we see respect for family, closeness between people, respect for ancestors, willingness to sacrifice, or if we are in fact living in that terminal decline stage when civilization is weak, decadent, atomized, people hate their family, they don't have any friends, and they hate their ancestors. Thank you.